this is beyond the spreadsheet. Okay, this is what this tech talk is going to be about. So I am back. You thought you were done with me, but instead of talking about everyday AI, I'm going to talk about Excel, 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 like top to bottom. Okay, they're working me hard today. How many of you use Excel? Like within a week, you open Excel. Like, okay, everyone. How many of you are power Excel users? You don't have to be shy. I mean, like, this is data IQ, but I, I am a proud Power Excel user. Okay. So by way of um, introduction, before I joined the software space in advanced analytics, I started in my career early. I was a research analyst, data analyst. And it was a big badge of honor back then that I was a, like an Excel wizard. And I didn't have to touch the mouse because I knew all the keyboard shortcuts and I was the VLOOKUP queen. And, you know, it was like the weekly report would come in and I'd be like, Shh, 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 and no one could replace me because no one else knew the steps that I knew. Okay. And everyone else had their own silos, but I had my domain. So this talk is about uh, how to translate your Excel mastery into data IQ if that is something that you're interested in doing and saving you time in data prep and going beyond into places that maybe you can't go now in spreadsheets. In this session, we're going to talk about some ways Data IQ and Excel are alike, some ways they're different, and some places you can go, like new adventures in data science, that Data IQ makes it really easy for you to explore in a safe way, and it's not scary. So here are some things that I think all of us have done in spreadsheets. You get some kind of extract, it's dirty, you clean it up, you transform it, you join it with uh, other workbooks or other you know, worksheets in that book. You do pivot tables, you copy and paste as values so that you can build charts, and then you embed those charts somewhere. Does that sound pretty reasonable? I mean, I'm like maybe a decade out of date, but I can't think this has changed that much. So what do we do in Excel? We write formulas. We do V and H lookups. We do pivot tables, conditional formatting, and we use the built-in charting. Or we just take some extract and pop it into Power BI or Tableau, if that's kind of the way we do it in your org. So this is the world in which most analysts still do work, most people in line of business still do work. If you're like me, you've come against at least one of these problems. If you're working with big data, like long text fields, okay, you run into cell character limits. If you've got tens or hundreds of thousands of rows and you're trying to fill down a formula, um, it you know does that weird laggy thing and you can't scroll for a little while or you're out of disk or whatever happens. So the slow load happens. If somebody's ever thrown you a project and saying, we need to do this again, but you didn't do the work, it's really hard to reverse engineer what they did. You don't know which steps they took that you can't see. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about versions, like V2, V3, V3, V4. It's really hard to iterate and modify sequences of operations. If I'm at step eight in my data prep uh, sequence and I realize I screwed something up at Step three, or I learn something new about my data, it's really hard in some cases to fix something upstream without undoing, 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 then redoing, redoing, which really stinks. And um, I never really became a huge macro wizard. I know some people are. I, I sort of, I don't know, it was like this masochistic thing. I would just go through it every time. I wouldn't automate it because I didn't trust that it would work if like a column order changed or something like that. So I didn't use a lot of macros. Most people probably don't either. So we're going to look at a spreadsheet. This is data that I just pulled off the web. These are airline reviews. And you know they're just things that you would write about an airline experience you have. You have the trip, the flight date, the airline, your itinerary, the class. And then you have some ratings for the survey. Really standard type of review data. And already, you know, my fingers are itching to clean this up. So immediately I look at this and I'm like, well, I've got to get rid of the every other row situation. OK, so that's. First thing, I see these encoding errors, which always come in web data. You have these encoding issues. I can see that there's columns that have been sort of concatenated here and pipe delimited that I'm going to want to split out. I can see that I've got not one, not two, but three different date formats, which is super classic. Okay, you have May 19 with a dash, April 2019, and over here you have like the 5th May 2019. So date formatting is a, is a super bear. And I want to do maybe some transformation. So this would be a very classical thing that I would work on in Excel. So how can data IQ help? 
if you're an analyst, you may feel like I did when I first entered this space, which is I'm a little bit hamstrung because I'm not a super Python or SQL coder. I can read other people's code, I can modify it, but doing it from scratch on my own is not super fun for me. And I always knew the things I needed to do, and I could kind of do in Excel, but I couldn't do them on data set, like an enterprise data set. So this is how Data IQ helped me four years ago when I first learned about Data IQ, data IQ product. When I took my first tutorials, I was like, oh, this is the piece I've been missing. It's intuitive, and it raises the ceiling, the technical ceiling for me. So we have visual recipes for pretty much everything. When you go into Data IQ and you look at a project, okay, this is kind of like a finished project. If you haven't taken any of our tutorials, um, maybe you didn't sit in the zero to 60 session over in the other room, a little bit of orientation here. You start off with a blank canvas. The pipeline builds itself as you add processors to, as you add recipes to data sets. So blue squares are data sets. They live somewhere. This shows me that it's S3. This shows me that it's Snowflake, right, based on the icon. This shows me that it's a, a data set from another project that I'm reusing. And as I work on a data set, I can use these recipes. Visual ones, if you prefer to point and click, save time. Code recipes, if you per prefer to do custom code. And you can see here that it's not an either or. You can mix and match. You can have people pop in because it's server-based. I can get stuck. Pass it to an expert like Kat, who's going next. She does something magical in Python, and then I take the output and keep going. That's a very classic way to work with my team here. So if I start with a data set, maybe that Excel one I just showed you. Let's go to uh, let's go to a, this blank. So it's going to read this Excel file. I'm going to configure the format before I go ahead and create the data set because it's going to see everything as string because it's a CSV. I want it to actually infer the, um, the types for, for storage optimization. So I'm just going to go to schema and say, you know, look at the values in here and make your best guess as, as to how I should store it. This just makes me a good data steward and the data engineers like when I do things like this. So I'll create this and I'll just call it reviews. Now I'm not going to show you everything that I would do in the prepare recipe, which is what we're going to go into in a minute. But I do want to spend like five or seven minutes showing you how easy it is to do Excel-like work in Data IQ. So right off the bat, you can see that I have a tabular view. It looks like a spreadsheet. And even if my data is in a bucket or it's in um, some crazy file format, like a parquet file, you know, some, some format or JSON or XML that I really can't do much with as a non-coder, it's going to show it to me as a spreadsheet. So beautiful. It gives me instant quality indicators. I can see here that 62% um, are missing. If I'm kind of curious from a data profiling perspective about my columns with this one view, I can kind of see, all right, I have a five point scale for these attributes, but my overall rating looks like a 10 point scale. I can immediately see the distributions and you'd see red quality bars if there was invalid values for the detected type. So this is one way to data profile. We'll look at some others in a minute. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a prepare recipe. You can see I have ones for joining data sets, for filtering, for ranking, but this one is a powerhouse because it has like a hundred different processors to do all different types of things. String formatting, geo handling, reshaping, you know, it's unfolding arrays, that kind of thing. Complex objects. I can even write code or I can write a formula. So the first thing I'm going to do is handle that date because it's very offensive to me that they would give me two different date formats from the same website in one column. So what I'm going to do, I'll make this even bigger, is first of all, the date flown is kind of like the key to me. If, I, if this review can't tell me what date they flew, I can't actually attribute it to something. So I'm going to remove any of the rows that don't have a date. Now I can do it here through the through the drop down menu where it's suggested to me. It kind of looks at it and says these are things we think you might want to do. Or as I'm looking at data, I can you know, kind of scroll and see it, right click and say, okay, let's let's trash the rows where there's nothing there. So now I see all green, no more empties. Let's parse that date. And again, it's recommended for me. And you can see here that it found one date format, month dash two digit year but now I'm missing these. 
So what if I try this? What if I try month, month, space, year, 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 year. All right, that looks like I got the rest of them. So I'm gonna actually go with that date format because I get more, but I don't wanna leave these guys behind. So every time I do something, the step gets recorded in my prepare recipe script. This is just like a recipe. You repeat these steps over and over, and when I have next month's data, I hit it with the same set of steps, and I get a repeatable output. That's why they're called recipes. Very cute. So let's add that other one in, so we get both. Okay, now I have date that Dataiku knows is a date, and I can start to take advantage of more suggested things, like maybe, um, We'll call it like review age. How long ago was this review until now in, um, you know, months? Okay. Oops. This should actually be a date one first. And I want to name it review age. Okay. So we're moving along. I can compute, I can say, calculate the date components. I want to split the month out, the year out, the date out, the week of year. You know, instead of using functions for week num, I just do it here. And anyone can follow this. I don't have to keep creating copies of columns with formulas. Okay. So I can do all kinds of things with dates. Let me go ahead and clean this up for my coworker who might have to run this analysis next time. And I'm just going to group these and we're just gonna say date handling. Okay, I can annotate this, whatever I like. Let's tackle another column. Let's take a look at this customer review. Well, the first thing that kind of offends me are the encoding issues. So I'm just gonna highlight this weird character. Actually, I'll highlight it with the ellipses. I don't really like these either. And I'm gonna say, replace it with nothing. And let's look at the full value and see if we see any more. This right here, that's an apostrophe. Okay, so you see what I'm doing, right? This is very, this is not magic, right? But it's very repeatable. Somebody else can see exactly which replacements I've made. So I might continue on, do these replacements. Now let's split this into two. Go down here, let's see if there's a split. Processor, I'll split the column. Customer review. The delimiter is a pipe. Okay, now I've got two columns. And notice in blue, what you're looking at is a preview. This shows me whether the thing that I'm asking it to do is actually what I want. And if I don't like it, then I know I can change this. Or if I want to see what it's like without it, I can disable it. So being able to preview it on a sample of the data will save you from running an operation on like millions of rows that might be wrong. So it's a quick gut, a quick gut check, and we use this all the time to look at previews. So again, I don't think this is super useful. I'm going to remove it. And here, it looks pretty simple. It looks like there's only two, two values, trip verified and trip not verified you might make a bad assumption that these are the only values there. But let's go and analyze it and see what is there. Okay, I've learned something about this data. Not every review had that verification field concatenated in the front. I've got some which go straight to the body of the review. I also have more of these characters that I don't want. But I didn't know that. So in Excel, how would I do this? Undo, 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 undo. Now do more find and replace. Now create a flag that if this doesn't have the word verified, then do this, you know, that kind of logic. Now you can do that here too. And it's probably what I would do. I'd probably write a formula that says if, if this field contains the word verified, then do this, else do that. So very consistent experience. But now I can start doing things like this. I can, I can copy that. I can put it into that earlier step as another find and replace, even though it was seven steps earlier. Or I can do things like this. Uh, these two mean the same thing. It happens all the time with forms that people can fill in. They don't put in standardized text, and you end up doing a lot of job, you know, time kind of normalizing them to the categories you want. Here, I can say um, merge these two. Let's call it trip verified, fine. 
will merge all of these as not verified. Great. And in fact, I could choose to merge all others into a long tail, or actually what I would do as a good analyst is I would handle these properly, which we won't do today. But you can see now, if I go back and I look at my script, well, it added all these new replacements. And if I go over here and look at the root, I might have some weird characters in here, uh, like here, like Istanbul. You see that? Another weird character. I didn't notice that one before. Let's copy it. Let's add it. Now, I fixed it in the review, but I also want to fix it in the route. Let's add another column. So that, that character encoding now replicates all those find and replacements to another text column. So you see how easy this is. Imagine doing this in Excel. And in fact, I did this in Excel, and I tried to compare and contrast the steps, but I couldn't, without taking a video, I couldn't even capture the steps I did in a way that you could see them after the fact. And that is the point. If I did these find and replace with any other way other than a find formula that you have to click in and then reverse engineer the, the pointers, nobody knows what I did. And if I messed up with the find and replace, nobody knows I did it. Now, somebody else on my team can do QA. If I throw this over the wall to a data scientist for the next leg of the race, they can look at this and say, I don't, I don't like the logic you did here. But they can see it. So uh, I'll pause here. I think you get the idea of what working in the prepare recipe is like. One thing to note is, I'll go back to my slides here. I'm doing this on a sample. Okay, this spreadsheet maybe only has like 60,000 rows. No big deal. That's probably going to run fine even on my local machine. But if I go to a project that has, uh, let's, let's look at this data set, like 19 million. And I try to run a formula on that. Can't do it in Excel, first of all. But also, that's, that's pretty painful. <laughs> and if I make a mistake and I can't preview it, it's going to run maybe in Snowflake or something, or I'm using cloud compute. I'm paying for that. And now I got to do it again. So now we have this idea of sampling, and you can choose the sampling mechanism to get fast responsive feedback on the sample you know, of your choice before you actually hit run, which runs it on everything. So down here, when I run it, I can use Spark, I can use Hive, you know, there's all different ways I can do this, but I can then push it down once I'm satisfied that it's going to work on my 20 million rows. Another thing is building charts and dashboards. So the classical flow would be you make a pivot table or you create some kind of sums and subtotals and then you copy those to another worksheet, you select the range, you make a chart. Okay, copy and paste it or you embed it. With Dataiku, on every table, you can build um, charts. So once I've run it, Again, I'm in a spreadsheet-like way. You have all these other tabs where you can do advanced statistics. You can find relationships in the data. Um, you can look at the history of who's done what to it. But I can also have like a little mini Tableau or Power BI built right into a data set. So I can see what the distribution looks like. I can create reports or I can know what the next step in my, in my workflow should be based on what I see in this biz. Now, if I like something or I want to share something with the team, I can publish it. I can publish it to a dashboard or a workspace, which is like a Pinterest board, essentially, for teams. Um, so I can choose all my, my charts, and I can publish them to a dashboard. Now, these are something that can be sent out. So now my end user doesn't have to see any of what I just did. All they see is this. That's what they get in their inbox every morning or whatever. So the join recipe. Well, the lookups. Now that I know better, they were pretty limiting. And you could really only do them easily one at a time. If we look at a flow with a lot of tables, you can see here, all these different streams are getting joined together in one recipe. Visually, I can see pretty complex join keys. I can choose different types of joins and it tells me what these things mean. I always forget, you know, like, 
I don't want to create some Cartesian product. So like, what am I going to do here with my join? And I can choose which columns to bring in from each data set. Again, very transparent to anybody else. And if I happen to be a SQL coder or want to aspire to be a SQL coder, well, it just built this gigantic query for me that now I can modify if I want, or I can send to somebody who can modify it as a SQL recipe. So behind the scenes, we're translating this to code so you don't have to know how to run it in Snowflake. We do that for you. You just set up your condition. So those are things that you can kind of do in Excel. Talking about a few things that start to go a little outside the Excel comfort window will be aggregations and like windowing recipes. If you want to do complex types of aggregation, we have group by recipes, and we also have these windows where you can do things like, okay, I have a file of um, purchase transactions, let's say, and I need to append a new column for each transaction that says, what is the average amount that me as a customer, just me, has spent in the last 30 days leading up to this particular transaction? That's like a calculation at a, at a customer level for every single row. I'm not trying to combine it into a group. I'm trying to enrich it with a window recipe. This is a pretty simple window recipe, but would be a total pain to do in Excel, to do a custom calculation by user team. So this is the kind of thing that starts to really make me feel like this is a more powerful tool than I could have done in a spreadsheet. And then way far beyond is, well, what do I do if I have images? What if I have audio files? What if I have long text fields or geo, you know, geospatial data? Dataiku has a ton of specialized tools for these types of unstructured data. So if you have addresses and you need to, somebody says, can you plot on a map um, in this case here, all the customers who fall within a 45 minute driving range of my physical store. Well, yeah, you can do that visually in Data Iku, along with the maps. Uh, if they say, show me all the customers that cannot get to one of my physical store locations, fall outside that isochrone, that driving range, I can do that based on these different types of join conditions with geospatial data. So this is really cool stuff. This is, um, the reality of enterprise data is you don't just have tabular data. So there's another session, I think, right after this, that it, I think it's in the other room, the hands-on lab for build one, reuse forever. And that talks about how to automate your flows, how to create little uh, recipes of your own based on the flow that you built. You don't have to be a, like a data engineer who can write bash scripts and set up cron jobs. Like I cannot do that, to be clear. But I can set up scenarios that automate, let's say, my personal data prep flow. So if I have these airline reviews and I have to get it to a reportable state, I can just tell data I could build that table every month on this day or when the data set input data set changes, just do everything again. And even if the column order changed, as long as the name didn't change, I'm good. If the name did change, it's going to throw up an alert and say something changed. Go look. So I can automate a lot of things here. Uh, and this is what really uh, uh, avoids this situation. This gives me trauma when I look at it because it's so real from from my previous life of, oh, we'll just let's make this change. Let's now like let's, let's make this change. But you don't want to overwrite your work, so you save as, and then you have file directories that look like this, and it's like final, 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 final v two, right? It just it doesn't it can't be me, right? It's not just me. Um, with this flow, you have one single source of truth. And you have versioning, so you can go back and see what actually changed from V2 to V3, but uh, in the end, the documentation and somebody else who onboards onto the project knows what the final last steps were in the end. So we talked about scenarios for automation. Uh, in the other room, they'll talk about creating Self-service applications. Again, I'm not an application developer. I know what Dash is, Streamlit, Shiny. Can't do it myself. But in Dataiku, we have visual ways to build applications so that now, instead of me getting the, the monthly request to handle those airline reviews, my business stakeholder, my business partner, can just take that Excel spreadsheet, drag it into this app, press go, 
and then they click look at the dashboard. I've taken myself out of the picture. All of my knowledge that I that I did in that pipeline is wrappered into this, this nice application that they can use on their own. Now I can do other things. So I can be an app dev um, myself, even with data prep. And then, of course, I mean, we could talk for another hour. And in fact, they're doing another session on modeling right now. We could talk about going other places, building machine learning models, testing them, learning how to do the explainability checks and bias checks and all these different things we have, and then deployment and ops. But uh, really, the message I want to leave you with is that you remove any technical barrier that you might have if you're an Excel power user. You can go further. You can kind of upskill. There's lots of guardrails and plain text English that helps you understand the concepts you're looking at. Um, so don't be intimidated to just play around, try to build, you know, build a model if you've got data IP today. I mean, you should check with an expert before you try to deploy anything, to be clear. But you can, you can do a lot of prototyping on your own. So if this session was intriguing to you, I would definitely uh, encourage you all to check out the Excel to Data IQ Quick Start. It's free on the Data IQ Academy, which is our learning and tutorials webpage where they've got all different types of modules you can learn more. And if you already have an environment, these tutorials are kind of baked in on your home screen. And if not, you can always spin up that free instance like you see out, out in the lobby and, uh, and just try it out for yourself. But I think you'll, you'll have a little bit of fun translating your mastery in Excel into so if product marketing can do it, you can definitely do it. That's the takeaway. All right. So um, next up is Kat Savchin, who's going to talk to you about, okay, this is great, but I'm a coder. <laughs> this is a toy. I need some real hands-on code. So Kat's going to talk about that.